Hey, what's up everybody? It's your boy Prof Trof and we're back again with another unbiased history video. This is the Severan Dynasty. Let's check it out. We're starting off with anime music, so it's bound to be good, man. Huh? Oh, by the way, uh, I started making my own thumbnails with Photoshop yesterday. Learning how to do that shit almost made me want to throw myself out of the building window in-game. So uh, let me know what y'all think about the thumbnail. Good, bad, criticism, suggestions, everything is appreciated. Thank you. Septimus Severus. Okay, it's gonna be one of those videos. It's gonna be an exciting video. <laughs> Last time on Unbiased History. After Marcus Aurelius had died of the Antonine Plague, he left the Empire to his Chad son, Commodus. Being a divine incarnation and a perfect athlete, Commodus dominated the gladiatorial arena for 15 glorious years, gaining the envy and hate of senators and praetorians alike. All After right. yet another assassination attempt on their part, coming as poison from his own lover no less, he vomited it all out and went to his personal bath. His enemies then bribed his wrestling mate, Narcissus, to finish the job. And after a long struggle, killing Commodus. <laughs> just fucking kidding. The historian Ridley Scott already debunked all this garbage. And with the Antonine dynasty and the Empire now in shambles thanks to Commodus. If you recall what happened after the julio claudian dynasty ended, you'll know it's time for a year of not four, but five emperors. You see, the Praetorians just didn't have the Emperor killed without thinking of the repercussions, they would never do that. Instead they dragged Pertinax to fill the void. After making him promise a huge fucking bribe too, they then forced the Senate to ratify him as Emperor, something they wanted to do anyway, and things looked good to be honest. Pertinax started to rebalance the economy, issue fair laws, and began restoring discipline to the Praetorian Guard. Yeah, about that. As he started paying out their bribes, the Imperial Treasury was emptied. Him. Zero gold left, nothing. Commodus had wasted it all. And when he explained that he could only pay half of what he was forced to promise, the Praetorians chipped out in rage. They constantly demanded the rest of the bribe, threatening to revolt several times, but there was nothing to pay them with, so Pertinax refused. Blaming everything on Pertinax, 300 of the most corrupt Praetorians invaded the Imperial Palace to hunt him down. Their prefect, a scourge named Elitus, was sent to calm them down but instead joined and led them towards the Emperor's office. Betrayed <laughs> by his men, Pertinax then confronted them himself and urged them to think about what they were doing. Here they were, the Emperor's own bodyguards, threatening him with violence over money. Money he didn't have for no fault of his own. Through a long speech, he gave them the chance to set aside their rage they so that they could work them. together to ensure the Empire's They trust. killed him for sure. Yep. So after killing Check Pertinax, his pocket. Ludus thought of a plan to both name a new emperor and far more to the point, get all that money they wanted. A plan so disgusting, immoral and vile it provokes anger at the mere thought of it. They would sell the empire to the highest bidder. Meanwhile, an extremely rich man named Daedus Julianus was eating dinner with his family. And when news that the empire was for fucking sale arrived, he hesitated, but his greedy wife and daughter forced him out of the house to go buy it. And that's what he did getting to the Women Praetorian hunt. camp and outbeating Pertinax's father-in-law with 25,000 sisters' his worth of bribes. The Praetorians then forced the Senate to ratify their new emperor again, and things didn't look good at all. Here's the thing, the provincial governors were more than happy with Pertinax taking over after Commodus, but Julianus, some literal who with no connections to the Antonines that was buying power, 
that something neither Pesquinius Niger in Syria, Clodius Albinus in Britannia, nor Septimius Severus in Pannonia were willing to accept, each for their own reasons. Pesquinius Niger was everyone's Wait, what favorite, were they were willing to accept. Each that dude wants power, that dude's size, that dude's my fame, my eastern For regions. their own reasons. Pesquinius Niger was everyone's favorite to take over power, much like Vespasian, commanding the Eastern Legions and all. Clodius Albinus had revolted against Commodus a few years earlier, now taking Pertinax's death to follow on his proclaimed wish to restore the Republic or some such nonsense. A wish revealed false after he accepted Severus's offer to become his subordinate heir, and as far as Severus could see, it was left to him to save the Empire from those idiots. His origins date back to the destruction of Carthage, as several Roman settlers began to colonize the non-salted lands through the centuries, among them the Severans. Despite the Marcomannic Wars and the Antonine Plague in his way, Severus climbed to the Cursus Honorum quickly, and after his wife died, Severus was told by an astrologer of a woman in the East destined to marry a king. He then tracked her down, Julia Domna was her name, being descended from one of the client kings Pompey had once set up, and a daughter of the High Priest of Soul. Coincidence? I fucking think not. With her, Severus had his first son, Bassianus, later nicknamed Caracalla after a Gallic cloak that he wore, and then a second one named Geta, a failed progeny, but such were the times. Julia Domina also had a sister, Julia Mesa, whom also had two children, Julia Suamis and okay. Julia. Why, there, why is each uh, subsequent female, the female child having bigger and bigger boobs? Julia Mamia. Huh? Yeah, I know, they just love that first name. After receiving Marcus Aurelius' respect, Severus would then spend his days cleaning up after Commodus' mess, being eventually appointed to Pannonia, where he commanded three veteran legions, and where he received news of Pertinax's death. <laughs> Duty bound to oust the usurper. The Praetorians are big Praetorian again. <laughs> Severus marched south and occupied a growing city called Ravenna, okay. where the Imperial fleet was. Okay. Considering at this point how many fucking emperors and uh, leaders of Rome they have killed. Has none of them tried to, you know, disband the Praetorians? Like, they've killed everybody at this point. Like, if everybody that they're supposed to be protecting, they've been killing. Like, Jesus. Or were they that strong that you cannot disband them? What's As a response, Julius forced the Senate to declare Severus an enemy of the state, sending several assassins disguised as diplomats to kill him. But whenever they got there, the moment they made eye contact with him, they either shit their pants or joined his side. Often both. Despised by all except the Praetorians that he bribed, Julianus sent them to defeat Severus, getting all annihilated by him. I don't know what he was expecting. Severus then camped outside Rome, nah, and instead of taking by force, in back, huh? he sent an ultimatum for the Praetorians to deliver Litus and all the Praetorians who partook in killing Pertinax. Their comrades betrayed them in a second, and Severus had them all executed. Julianus was later dragged to a dark room, and before being executed, he cried, But what evil have I done? Whom have I killed? And I can answer that. One, listening to his wife, and two, by consequence, himself. The Senate then recognized Severus as the new emperor, not that he cared. In such times of absolute political corruption and decadence, the army was the only institution that mattered. And to further this point, Severus had all remaining members of the Praetorian Guard line up, confiscating their property and wealth, exiling them all, and filling it up with four times more men, all veterans from his legions, and giving them all the assets he seized. That settled, Severus gathered his legions to deal with Pescinius Niger in Syria, whom, after a few months after Pertinax's death, had moved from Antioch to Bithynia. In the same time, Severus had marched south, deposed Julianus, rested a bit, sailed west, and arrived in Bithynia. After a few losses. What? What? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So. For the time that this dude needed to go from here to Rome to become emperor, to sail to over here, this guy needed the same amount of time to go to here, from here to here. Here, 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 here. How? A uh, how? Of the post Julianus rested a bit, sailed west, and arrived in Bithynia. <laughs> After a few lost skirmishes, Niger made a last stand at Athens, <laughs> where he <laughs> hoped to larp as Alexander as he defeated the Persians there hundreds of years ago. Instead, Alexand Alexander, the literal who killed some Persians here, wants to end brain. Let's still worship him for it. He's not a big fan of Alexander, I see. He played the part of the Persian king, getting absolutely trashed and fleeing the battlefield towards the nearest city he could. 
with the gods or clearly something against him, he was later captured and killed. But Cervetus then had to deal with the last of Niger's strongholds, a small irrelevant village called... what? Byzantium was it? Yeah, yeah, something like that. And soon it became clear just how fucking hard it was to siege it. It took Severus two fucking years to finally capture it, Oof. and it made him so mad he ordered all fortifications of the city destroyed, hoping it would be forgotten to time. And when you make Severus angry, the consequences are severe. For the Parthians, most of all, he just invaded them with no warning. When you make severe, Severus angry, the consequences are severe. I see what killed a boy. bunch of barbarians <laughs> to vent off, then returned to the Empire. Speaking of barbarians, Severus had camped his legions on Thrace on his way to Rome, which is where his pleb soldiers kept being bested in sports by a local romano thracian teenager. Defeating all his pleb troops V's and rivaling his best men with his 8 feet stature, the young Maximinus Frax took over the emperor's horse, demanding to be led into the legions. He lacked discipline, but the legions were already mostly plebs anyway, so why not? Back in Rome, Severus relayed his victories in the east to Albinus in Britannia, and bored out of his mind in that shitty island, he invented some bullshit about Severus having tried to murder him, blah 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 blah, revolting against him and taking over Lugdunum in Gaul. With these pleasant news, Severus named his eldest son Caracalla as his heir, and set off for the north. Albinus' strategy to win relied entirely on bribing the Rhine legions to his side, but thanks to the disciplining legacy of both Domitian and Hadrian, they refused. Once Severus arrived at Lugdunum with 150,000 men, he found Albinus with an equal force to match starting the greatest legion-on-legion -legion battle in Roman Boy. history. After two days of brutal fighting and Severus focusing on his shitty troops on the left, his true soldiers on the right broke through the enemy lines, and some opportunists named Julius Leda stole the credit for it. Coincidence? No fucking way. Much like Niger, Albinus fled to the nearest city he could, but this time he spared everyone the trouble and just killed himself. Severus then walked oh over his desecrated corpse, cutting off his head and sending it to Rome, alongside oh. his limbs and those of his family. <gasps> Having won the civil war, Severus ordered an empire-wide purge of all supporters of Niger and Albinus, killing some 30 senators in the process and giving all their property to his soldiers, then doubling their annual pay for good measure. Yo, this guy did not fuck around. His reasoning, if you bad, you die. Being dead, he could either no, bribe his pleb around. legions into compliance at the expense of the economy to prevent any revolts, or he could rely on the Senate's wise administration to ensure peace in the provinces. Corrupt senator Fast fucking chance. So he debased the currency to pay what he needed, <laughs> which would become a standard practice. And it hadn't taken even a couple of years before his new Praetorians started getting filled with corrupted plebs, oh, as their shit. prefect, Plotianus, would soon show. Predictably, Severus found the administrative life of an emperor absolute torture. Caught between correcting for the senate's incompetence, the plebs' idiocy, and the Praetorian Guard's growing corruption, he decided to do what he was best at, fucking off to the provinces and killing Rome's enemies. Getting back to Parthia, again, after they decided to mass their armies for an upcoming invasion. But Severus saw through their shit, preemptively invading and ransacking his way down the Euphrates, a Roman tradition by this point. And after Julius Leda's failed repeatedly to take the city of Hatra, along with plenty of insubordination on his part, Severus had him executed, and then personally tortured the inhabitants of Hatra with a long siege, annexing all the surrounding areas of northern Mesopotamia and letting them stay abandoned in a sea of red. Now here's something both neat and depressing. Severus also expanded the empire deep into the desert, asserting dominance over several oasis cities, such as Palmyra. There he met a single civilized noble family, which so impressed him that he gave them Roman citizenship as well as his first name. And here is where the Odinafus family started out. The depressing part will come later. And to celebrate his victory, Severus ordered built the Ark of Septimius Severus in Rome. I told you people would copy Titus, Severus was just the first one. Around this time, a lot of Christians would be persecuted, not for Severus' doing that. Dead Jew on a stick is my witness, you regret this. <laughs> <laughs> so, he adhered to Trajan's policy of meh towards them, getting bored at the mere mention of their crucified Jew. So to cure that, he returned to his home in Africa, campaigning deep into the Sahara, expanding the empire to protect his home city of Leptis Magna. Meanwhile, Claudianus was playing the part Corrupt of St. James, steel, abusing power, demanding personal loyalty, thinking himself the hot shit and all the rest. Back in Rome again to oversee his unimportant brother's last moments, he testified against Plodianus' crimes as prefect, dying shortly after. It was then that Caracal approached his father, warning him of a Praetorian plot Plodianus was crafting against him. 
the Severans then faced Plodianus, striked him down and ordered his execution. Once dead, and his family exiled to Sicily, the full burden of the state fell on Severus once more, driving him so suicidally angry that when news came that the Picts were stirring up trouble in the north, Severus took the chance for one last campaign. But that was the last nail in the coffin, both for Severus' patience and his life. The moment he arrived in Caledonia, after rebuilding Antonine's wall and marching south, the Picts fled to the highlands like the cowards they've always been. Such was their cowardice, in fact, that not only did they only attack when the Romans weren't looking, but they abandoned their women and children in the lowlands. Furious to the core at their cowardice, Severus became yet another emperor to advocate barbarian genocide, ordering the absolute slaughter of the pigs with his immortal words. Let none escape sheer destruction, not even the babe in the womb of the mother. And while Jesus. they carried on genociding the Picts, Geta was offering the more corruptible plebeian soldiers with bribes to gain their support. His patience exhausted with such matters, Severus rewrote his will to make both of his sons emperors, on the condition that they were harmonious with each other, paid heed only to the legions, and never, ever care about what the senate or anyone else thinks. His succession settled, Severus chose to take a drastic decision. Kill he died. Oh. And thus Caracalla and his younger brother Geta were acclaimed to the co-emperors of Rome. But here's the thing, Geta hated Caracalla. Busy with restoring order to the empire, Severus had no time to raise his children. Caracalla embraced his father's harsh virtues, but Geta had become nothing but yet another hedonist prince, and while the eldest loved his brother, it was never reciprocal. Geta never spoke to him, slept, ate and lived as far away from his brother as possible, always surrounded by guards and suspicious 24-7. Some have suggested that they split the empire between themselves. Caracalla got the west and Geta got the east, but the former refused. It was a really stupid idea. Seriously, what kind of retard would permanently split the empire between two brothers like that? Stupid. So stupid. So the feud was left to be resolved by their mother Domna, whom dragged both of them into the same room to talk unarmed. You know, it was the typical drivel. You're brothers, you're supposed to love yourselves, violence is not the answer, blah blah blah. A speech so boring and annoying to hear that a guard standing outside just stormed in without orders and murdered Geta in front of her. Absolutely devastated at his brother's death, Caracalla called on his other Praetorians to deal with his brother's assassin. What? Why? Why did they kill him? Who killed him? Who? And once he finally calmed down, he assumed the unwanted burden of being the sole emperor. To show his love for his deceased brother, Caracalla ordered all plebs who had ever negatively influenced Geta to be executed, killing tens of thousands of plebs in the first year of his reign. <gasps> for now Caracalla held nothing in his heart Damn, but disdain bro. for plebs. To start out his reign, he had the homes and businesses of thousands of plebs in Rome demolished, and in their place he ordered the baths of Caracalla to be built, by far the best of its kind to ever grace the Eternal City. Shame it was flooded by plebs. Next, he ordered an edict that made every single man in the empire a Roman citizen. Yes, all plaid men were citizens now. Just so that now they were forced to pay taxes. <laughs> After having his former wife strangled in Sicily and erasing all mentions and portrayals of Geta in money. <laughs> he made them all citizens just so to pay taxes. Citizens now, just so that now they were forced to pay taxes, the fucking madman. After having his former wife strangled in Sicily and erasing all mentions and portrayals of Geta in monuments in which he didn't look very good, all of them that is, Caracalla sought to emulate Hadrian and travel through the provinces of the empire. And as Hadrian did, starting in the Rhine, where he crushed an incoming Alemanni invasion, taking the title of Alemannicus Germanicus. As he continued his travels, he demanded that all cities he passed through build great monuments in his honor at their own expense. And once they were finished, he either ignored them or ordered them destroyed for not being up to his standards. He then held massive parties, hoarding all of the city's food and inviting no one to them. And on that topic, <laughs> he only ate fish food when it was far enough inland that it became an expensive commodity, demanding luxurious seafood for dinner and executing all plebs who didn't comply. One day, one of Pertinax's sons had the audacity to call Caracalla Gedicus, implying that he killed his own beloved brother. Safe to say such insults didn't go unpunished. As he left the west, he extended his disdain to the barbarians in the east, demanding several high-ranking Dacians to be taken hostage and imprisoning the Armenian king to emulate Trajan. 
and then setting sail to the vital province of Egypt. But to his dismay, once he arrived, the citizens of Alexandria saw fit to welcome their emperor with a play that mocked his brother's death, spreading the abhorrent lie that it was him that killed Geta. That made him very... Oh shit. Here we go again. How many people did he kill? Very angry. And when you make Caracalla angry, well... Tens of thousands of plebs were then slaughtered in Alexandria. The city set ablaze and the legions allowed to plunder it at will. As he reported his deeds to the Senate, he told them nothing but the truth. It was the whole city of Alexandria that was guilty. Then persecuting Greek white philosophers just because he could. Not that he really cared about what the Senate thought. Being a true son of Severus, he gave only the legions his attention. Raising their salaries and giving several surprise bonuses so that Oi, these motherfuckers have gotten a salary a salary raise like five times already in this video. How much money were they getting? Uh, this, uh, the civil war was right a there, possibility. Bro. And with the Empire not <laughs> prospering thanks to him, Caracalla was greeted by the Parthian king. After centuries of getting their teeth kicked in by the Romans, the Parthians came to negotiate an alliance through an arranged marriage. Oh, fuck no my less. Caracalla agreed, traveling with his family and men to Tessaphon, where he married the Parthian princess, ushering a new era of peace and tolerance between Romans and Parthians. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, he ordered no. the whole Parthian wedding party slaughtered, set Tessaphon ablaze, then ransacked his way back to the empire, renaming himself Parthicus, as the whole of Parthia now bowed at his feet. But behind every good emperor, there's a treacherous Praetorian. This dude was a crazy. This, he was insane, bro. Why, why is he killing everybody? Chin <laughs> to betray him. Macrinus, in this case. What triggered this particular Praetorian prefect to act against Caracalla was that an astrologer had begun prophesizing that he would one day become emperor. At first, he reacted like a coward, doing everything he could to shut the astrologer up, to no avail. No. So then he took the treacherous option. A chill afternoon in the desert, as Caracalla was looking for a place to piss in the sand, Macrinus approached a disgruntled soldier whom the Emperor had denied the promotion to Centurion earlier. Step by step, he neared Caracalla, Macrinus telling the other Praetorians everything was fine. And before Caracalla knew it, he was being backstabbed to death. The assassin was then shot down, but too little, too late. Now, we've been here before. With the Praetorians having killed the Emperor, Macrinus, after failing to find anyone to buy the position with bribes, he did the next worst thing, and just took the position for himself. And the Senate did their duty to recognize as Emperor whatever man the Praetorians forced them to. But it didn't mean that to the Severan family would roll with it. Julia Domna, on one hand, refused to be exiled from Rome, going on a hunger strike and starving herself to death. On the other hand, her sister, Julia Mesa, conspired to have one of her grandsons be her puppet to take back power. Either of them would do in her eyes, so she chose the eldest among them, Elegabalus. To kick things off, she revealed that Elegabalus was actually the bastard son of Caracalla, and thus the rightful heir to the Empire. Once the news reached one of the Eastern Legions, they instantly revolted in favor of Elegabalus. All while Macrinus was busy sucking up to all of Rome's enemies, returning the Dacian hostages, appointing the imprisoned Armenian king's son to take his father's place, and even paying off the Parthians not to attack him, only then hearing of what was happening in Syria. He then sent his Praetorians to deal with them, but instead got all annihilated. Deja vu. Left abandoned, Macrinus mustered what troops he still had left to confront the rebelling legion. As they battled, Elagabalus bravely charged through enemy lines to rally the eagle standard, routing the enemy forces, including Macrinus, whom then fled to the battlefield. He was later found in Cappadocia and executed by the resurgent Severans. He was the first emperor to have never set foot in Rome while in office. You... you'll get used to it. On that matter, and would you believe, the Senate bowed down to their newly proclaimed emperor. Wow. Didn't see that one fucking Surprise. coming. And he was even so kind as to order a huge portrait of himself hanged on the Senate's walls, coupled with a statue of Victoria, goddess of victory. Get ready for the ride. Simply said, Elegabalus was the opposite of Hadrian on the faggotry spectrum. For Royal Hadrian fucked every feminine dude he took a liking to- <laughs> Come on, bro, you can't- <laughs> Is this gonna make me die from laughter, my guy? <laughs> That's a victory. Get ready for the ride. Why Simply did said, it Elegabalus like was the opposite of Hadrian on the faggotry spectrum. For Royal Hadrian fucked every feminine dude he took a liking to, Elegabalus let himself be fucked by any masculine dude who liked him. A true bottom's bottom, a sub comes through and through, you get it. But there's a very good reason for all this degeneracy. 
having been born and raised at the service of the ancient solar deity, Elegabalu served him like no other. Such was his piety, that one day he was granted an enlightened vision. After centuries of Roman virtues being diluted by plebs and barbarians alike, the original Trojan virtues of the old Romans was drowned in a sea of degeneracy, such as Christ cookery. This in turn weakened the gods to such a state that Elegabalus was able to glimpse at their true nature. Throughout all of Roman history, from the monarchs, republicans and emperors thereafter, its greatest heroes were blessed by soul for various means. Focusing the praise for all of Rome's gods into one, he merged their qualities into one divine essence. Ay, 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 ay. Deus Sol Invictus, the overarching divinity composing all of Rome's deities, and thus, the one true god. After making this cataclysmic discovery, the cult named Elagabalus their grand priest, which is where he adopted that name by the way. Unfortunately, matters of deep theology were often too much to understand, especially to a mere plebeian's mind. So Elagabalus, learning of the degenerate cesspool Rome became while being dragged around by his grandmother, he chose to fight degeneracy with degeneracy. To ensure no one could ignore his divine message, Elagabalus indulged in the most obscene, debauched taboos in Roman society. Not only did he dress, act and speak like a woman, but an unashamed whore. Not only making sure everyone knew he got fucked daily by his slave chariot driver, Hierocles, but expressing delight every time he was called Hierocles' queen. During the night, he stood naked outside his bedroom, soliciting any passerby to come fuck him hard in his bed. At dinner, he served his guests delicacies like camel hoo- Really wrong? This your emperor now? What the? How do we go from the dude that kills everybody? For no reason, to the dude that gets fucked by everybody, for no reason. Moves and parrot mm -hmm. brains, and if they didn't eat it, he released lions to eat them instead. <gasps> Whenever in a high place, he threw gold at the streets to watch the plebs kill each other over it. In the imperial palace, he had big titted women stripped naked and forced to push his chariot around while being lashed. And big dicked men organized in lines according to their dick size and giving them government positions to match. <laughs> and one day he ordered that a lion, a monkey, and a snake be thrown together into a dark room and threw the genitals of his executed enemies in it. Why you ask? Well, he never did give a reason. This outrageous behavior for an emperor had everyone's eyes on him, which was precisely the point. Having finally gained their attention, Elegabalus then began spreading the word of Sol Invictus, that all Roman oh, gods shit. were but partial derivations from his divinity, Why and that the end of the world was nigh. <laughs> nah, nah, he didn't share that with them. Included in his religious reforms was that no god could be worshipped without first praising the sun, although he did take some getting used to it. Paramount to his reforms were the triumph-like festivals of a divine black meteorite representing Sol Invictus, which was paraded around in a glorious chariot for all to admire. And finally, the creation of a special festival date dedicated for Deus Sol Invictus, celebrated every winter solstice at the 25th of December in place of Saturnalia, which would become so popular that the Christ cooks would steal it for themselves centuries later. Being righteously I don't know, just tell everyone that Joan Stick was born in this day or something. Self centuries later. <laughs> being righteously forced to participate in such festivals, at the threat of being crushed <laughs> under a giant <laughs> mount of flowers, the senators and praetorians grew to hate Elegabalus. It also didn't help when he took a vestal virgin as his wife, among the five or so wives he had in total, and I'm not making this up, asking his doctors for a sex change operation, but that proved to be too much, even for him. What also didn't help was that Julia Maisa had been using her grandson's authority to grab as much power for her as possible, even forcing herself into senate hearings. A woman in the senate. Now that's fucking blasphemy. No wonder Elagabalus wished to replace them all with woman. Might as well at this point. And good thing that Elagabalus never served as the puppet her grandmother wanted. Completely autonomous in his religious mission, Maisa was then forced to rely on Alexander Severus and his mother Julia Mamia to ensure her position. Securing the fact Alexander was far easier to manipulate, she tricked Elagabalus into naming him his heir, while he didn't have any sons of his own. He would only later find out it was part of her plot to kill him. After assassination attempt after assassination attempt later, <laughs> all coming from the Praetorians and masterminded by Mesa, Elagabalus dodged them all, and as punishment revoked Alexander's status as imperial heir. And just to fuck with them, he spread the rumor Alexander was near death, triggering Mesa and thus the Praetorians immensely. After showing them Alexander to reveal everything was fine, the Praetorians acclaimed him as Caesar. Elagabalus then stepped up, ordering the execution of all who did so. 
and with his mother by his side, the Praetorians then encircled the young oh, emperor, shit. murdering them both right then and there. Wait, both? Why is it that divine emperors only rule for a couple of years, I wonder? With his rule ended and body thrown to the Tiber River, Elagabalus' oh, cousin Alexander was acclaimed the new emperor. Alexander Caesar? Caesar Alexander? I'm Dead? gonna cry a lot editing the next episode. Oh, shit. But the qualities that made Alexander such a good puppet also made him a cowardly crybaby. His mother, Mamia, knew that well. So to try and blur the fact Rome was now at the mercy of her puppet, she compensated by organizing an advisory council led by the two senators still worth a damn in the Senate. Those being Opian, the greatest Roman jurist of all time, named as Praetorian Prefect, and none other than Cassius Dio, one of Rome's greatest historians and a vicious humorist. Muda, muda, After Mesa's okay. undeservedly peaceful death and the burden of state laid on their shoulders, they set about <laughs> reducing taxes on the provinces, revaluing the currency, and restoring discipline to the Praetorians. And God, why do people even try that anymore? The Praetorians, predictably, abhorred the mere thought of them not doing whatever they wanted without repercussions, Nicola. and with Opian leading such an effort, they sought to kill him. The bravest Roman citizens tried to stop them, but the Praetorians just carved through them, invading the Imperial Palace and murdering Opian at the feet of Alexander, who was too weak to stop them. And on the topic of Alexander's weakness, his mother Mamia had just arranged him a marriage with a daughter of a senator. But, once Alex started spending time with his wife, Mamia felt her influence over him threatened, so she accused her father of conspiring against the Emperor, ordering his death and the exile of his daughter to Syria. And much like Tiberius' early reign, Alex was plagued with legionary revolts left and right. No one Mom. wanted to swear allegiance to some mama's boy, much less with him reducing their payments. His severe predecessors were right all along, as it turns out. And then the last leg of his administration, Cassius Dio, also became the target of the Praetorian's rage, with his sarcastic comments leaving nothing to the imagination. Once more, being too weak to defend his advisor, Alex had Cassius Dio exiled to Bithynia, where he finished his historical works and taught us about all the drama from his time. And not that far from Bithynia, we return to Parthia, not for war, but to say goodbye to their crumbling dynasty. The details of barbarian politics bore me, so I'll be brief. After centuries of getting bashed by Rome, the Parthians became weak and found themselves in another civil war between two brothers. While they fought, an ancient evil had been brewing in southern Persia. Oh, no. There, a brutal barbarian rebelled and summoned his legions from the underworld, crushing a punitive <laughs> army and then a second one led by one of the brothers, later hunting the second one down. Crowning himself the king of kings and the first emperor of the Sassanid dynasty, ah. Ardashir desired one thing only the destruction of Rome. <laughs> Once Alex heard news of the eastern hordes gathering near Mesopotamia, he sent endless envoys to try and negotiate Maybe a peace. peace <laughs> but peace was a foreign concept to such a manifestation of pure evil. In exchange for such a... Hmm, peace, Ardishir demanded all of Rome's eastern provinces so that he could bask in the blood of its innocent civilians. Obviously, with the legates forcing his mother to refuse, she then forced his son to go to war. Gathering most of the Rhine and Danube legions to the east, Alex planned a three-way invasion from the north, south, and at the center, led by himself. But as what? both wings were accomplishing their objectives, Alex abandoned his invasion out of pure cowardice, allowing Ardashir's endless hordes to overwhelm the southern legions, thus forcing the northern legions to march back through the Armenian mountains on winter. Being completely at fault for the deaths of countless of his soldiers, Alex was like, Bruh, how are you such a little bitch? How? Lucky to realize, Ardashir became very busy eating the flesh of the plebeian soldiers he killed to wage war anymore. So mm. Alex just declared victory and left, mirroring Marcus Aurelius' Parthian war, being forced to relocate to the Rhine and Danube legions, the germs raided the empire, killing the defenseless families of many legionnaires. Enraged at the Princeps cowardice, their families' deaths, and the fact that not only was their emperor controlled by his mother, but a stingy autocrat that made them live in slave-like conditions, loyalty became rarer and rarer. The final straw came Come when on, Alex him. arrived in the Rhine, and instead of he beating the Germans again. back to their mud huts, he offered them even more golden rewards if they would be so kind as to leave, as they continued to slaughter the civilians and burn the cities. Enough was enough, all they needed was a leader, Revolve. which gets us back to Maximinus Frax, by then a legate and a respected trainer of recruits. As he walked in to eat breakfast, the legions acclaimed him the new emperor like it was a surprise party. 
taken aback, but understanding their motivations, Frax accepted the title and ordered his centurions to realize the wishes of every soldier present. <laughs> be the 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 gold again. Tent, together with his mother laying on her hoarded wealth, the centurions had them both executed. With him died the Severan dynasty, and unbeknownst to the soldiers, Rome as we know it. For when the legions got rid of such a weak emperor, he was an order they invited back, but chaos. The following decades would be filled with war, pestilence, death, and much, much worse. Only a miracle will save Rome from what's to come. Here starts the crisis of the third century. The great barbarian invasions or shit. That's when we came in over there at some point. Well, it was during the 6th, 7th century, but close enough. <laughs> close enough. <laughs> Wait, stop. stop. <laughs> anyway, this was a bias history, the Severan Dynasty. I, uh, I enjoyed this video immensely. This dude, I love this dude. This dude is a monster. He's a beast. You should check him out for sure. These videos, they warm my heart. I love these videos. Anyway, that was, uh, that was it, boys. That was it, boys and girls five girls that I have probably watching the channel maybe four like comment subscribe and I'll see you next time everybody have a nice working day